Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Kindly support me by sending me a super thanks from $2, 2 pounds or 2 euros or alternatively support me through Patreon. A short history of the Saracens by Sayyid Amir Ali. Start of Chapter 4, Part 1 The Republic Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu The hold which the personality of the Arabian Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had acquired over the minds of his followers is shown by the fact that none of them would at first believe that he was dead. They could hardly realize that the man who in the course of a few years had changed the whole aspect of Arabia was subject to the same laws as other human beings. Had he lived in a less historical age, or had his words with reference to himself been less rationalistic, like other great men, he too probably would have received divine honors. The commotion among the people was allayed by the venerable Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who having ascertained that their teacher was really dead and not in a swoon, as some had asserted, addressed the crowd thus. Muslims, if you adored Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is dead. If it is God that you adore, know that he liveth, he never dies. Forget not the verse of the Qur'an. Muhammad is only a man charged with a mission. Before him, there have been men who received the heavenly mission and died. Know this verse, Thou too, Muhammad, shalt die as others have died before thee. It was then that a wail went up from the assembled multitude that their great master was gone from among them. And now arose the question as to who was to succeed in the government of the commonwealth. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had often indicated Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu as his successor, but had laid down to definite rule. This gave scope to individual ambitions, to the detriment of Islam, and in later times became the fruitful cause of dynastic wars and religious schisms. Had Ali ta'ala anhu been accepted to the headship of Islam, the birth of those disastrous pretensions that led to so much bloodshed in the Muslim world would have been averted. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu is elected caliph. Among the Arabs, the chieftaincy of a tribe is not hereditary but elective. The principle of universal suffrage is recognized in its extremest form, and all the members of the tribe have a voice in the election of their chief. The election is made on the basis of seniority among the surviving male members of the deceased chieftain's family. This old tribal custom was followed in the choice of a successor to the Prophet وسلم, for the urgency of the times admitted of no delay. Abu Bakr anhu, who by virtue of his age and the position he had held at Mecca, occupied a high place in the estimation of the Arabs, was hastily elected to the office of Khalifa, or vicegerent of the Prophet ﷺ. He was recognized as a man of wisdom and moderation, and his election was accepted with their usual devotion to the faith by Ali and the chief members of Muhammad's family. Behold me, said the patriarch, after the multitude had sworn allegiance to him. Behold me charged with the cares of government. I am not the best among you. I need all your advice and all your help. If I do well, support me. 
If I mistake, counsel me. To tell truth to a person commissioned to rule is faithful allegiance. To conceal it is treason. In my sight, the powerful and the weak are alike, and to both I wish to render justice, as I obey God and his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Obey me. If I neglect the laws of God and the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have no more right to your obedience. The Rising of the Tribes No sooner had it become noised abroad that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was dead than the unruly spirit of the Arab broke forth. Whilst a great fear fell upon the earnest followers of the new faith, some of the tribes who had only recently abandoned idolatry reverted at once to their evil ways, and several impostors who had appeared in distant provinces in the lifetime of the Prophet wasallam, began harrying the Muslims. Within a little time, the faith had become almost confined to the city of Medina, and again a single town had to contend against the idolatrous hordes of the peninsula. Osama's Expedition The rising of the tribes was due, firstly, to the strict rules of morality enforced by Islam, and secondly, to their unwillingness to pay the poor tax. Though hemmed in on all sides, the Muslims did not lose heart and faith and enthusiasm again led them to victory. The first care of the Caliph, after the funeral ceremonies of the Prophet wasallam, was to organize the administration and stand on guard against the rebels. Muhammad wasallam, had shortly before his death issued orders for the dispatch of an expedition into Syria to seek reparation for the murder of the Muslim envoy. With that object, troops had been collected in the neighborhood of Medina. The expedition now became doubly necessary by the defection of the northern tribes, who had fallen away after the disaster at Muta, where the faithful Zad had lost his life. To give effect to his master's fast wishes, and to restore order on the northern frontier. Abu Bakr, anhu, though hard pressed himself, sent forward the troops. When the Muslims were departing, the aged caliph addressed them as follows. See, said he, addressing Usama, anhu, the son of Zad, anhu, who was placed at the head of the expedition. See that thou avoidest treachery. Depart not in any wise from the right. Thou shalt mutilate none, neither shalt thou kill child or aged man, nor any woman. Inter not the date palm, neither burn it with fire, and cut not down any tree wherein is food for man or beast. Slay not the flocks or herds or camels, saving for needful sustenance. Ye may eat of the meat which the men of the land shall bring unto you in their vessels, making mention thereon of the name of the Lord. And the monks with shaven heads, if they submit, leave them unmolested. Now march forward in the name of the Lord, and may he protect you from the sword and pestilence. Pacification of the Peninsula Whilst Osama was away in the north, Medina was attacked by the rebels, but they were beaten back. Osama anhu, also gained a victory over the Syrians, and shortly after returned to the help of Abu Bakr, anhu, who was now able to send out troops to reduce the insurgent tribes to order. The principal work of subjection was entrusted to Khalid, son of Walid, a ferocious soldier but a skilled general. Some of the tribes gave in their adhesion without fighting, others were unyielding, 
and with them were fought great battles, in which both sides suffered severely. At the Battle of Yamama, the formidable tribe of the Banu Hanifa were thoroughly defeated, and their leader, the impostor Mosalima, was killed. After this, the insurgents gradually submitted and were received back into Islam. War with Persia The work of pacification in the northeast of Arabia brought the Muslims into collision with the wandering tribes subject to Hira, a semi-Arab kingdom which at that time acknowledged the suzerainty of Persia. A glance at the map will show how the conflict, which afterwards widened into a struggle for empire, originally arose. From Hajar, the northeast corner of Arabia which borders on Chaldea, then held by the Persians, and westward of the lower branch of the Euphrates, lie that waterless tract, a continuation of the Arabian Nafud, far away to the Dead Sea, and the highlands of Hauran and ancient Tadmor towards the north. Over this vast tract roamed then, as now, the nomadic hordes, whose names alone have changed, but whose manners and habits have remained the same. They were chiefly Christians. Those on the Syrian side, like the Ghassan, were subject to the Byzantines. Those on the east, like the Banu Taghlib, owed allegiance to Persia. All these were connected by ties of blood and friendship with the neighboring Arabian tribes. The delta of the Euphrates itself was inhabited by settled Arabs, who had abandoned the pastoral life of their kinsmen of the desert and taken to the cultivation of the soil. Naturally, the conflict between the Muslims and the insurgents on the eastern shores of the Persian Gulf reacted on the neighboring tribes subject to Persia. Raids from the north were followed by reprisals with the same result that we now see in the advance of the British in India and of the Russians in Central Asia. The region watered by the two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, has from time immemorial formed the prize of monarchs struggling for empire. On one side, the Tigris, also known as the Jala, issuing from the mountains of Armenia. On the other, the Euphrates, also known as Furat, taking its rise in the heights of Taurus, roll down towards the Persian Gulf joining their waters a few hundred miles before they reach the sea. Here they lose their names as well as their identity and receive the designation of the Shatul Arab. The upper portion of the region enclosed by the two rivers was in ancient times known as Mesopotamia. The lower part, a flat alluvial country, was called Babylonia and Chaldea. To the Arabs, it was known as Iraq Arab. Many flourishing cities have existed by the side of these famous rivers. Ancient Nineveh, not far from modern Mosul, the seat of the mighty Assyrian monarchs, was situated on the Tigris. So was Madain, the capital of the Persian sovereigns. So is Baghdad, the metropolis of the caliphs in the Middle Ages, and now the seat of the provincial Turkish governors. On the Euphrates was situated ancient Babylon, Hira, Kufa, built by the Arabs, Circassia, ancient Circassium, and Raqqa. To the east of the Zagros Mountains, beyond the Tigris, lies the country called by the Arabs, Iraq Ajam, the center of Persia. The Capitulation of Hira The pacification of the peninsula having been completed, Khalid and Mosanna, the generals operating in Hijr, took in hand the repression of the raids from the Hirite side. The Persian governor of Chaldea offered battle on the frontier and was defeated with heavy loss, and Hira, after a short resistance, capitulated to the Muslims. 
Rabiul Level 12 Hijri May or June 633 after Christ Following the example of the people of Hirat, the Dakans or great landed proprietors of Chaldea gave in their addition and were guaranteed in their possessions subject to a fixed land tax. The peasantry were not interfered with and were left in the safe enjoyment of their fields and lands. The conquest of Hira opened the eyes of the Persian government to the gravity of the danger. A young and rising power animated with a national sentiment in the shape of religious enthusiasm was now seated at their door. Had they been wise, they would have strengthened their internal defenses and reorganized their empire, which was rent by domestic quarrels. They might even have come to terms with the Saracens. Still, the Persian Empire was rich and powerful. It comprised within its dominions the whole of modern Persia, Bactria, and all the inferior provinces of Central Asia to the confines of Tartary and India, besides Iraq and Mesopotamia. A large army was sent to drive the Saracens out of Chaldea. Death of Abu Bakr, Rodiallah ta'ala anhu, 23rd of August, 634 after Christ. About this time, the Caliph was obliged to send Khalid Rodiallah ta'ala anhu into Syria with half of the troops. The other general, Mutsanna, Rodiallah ta'ala anhu, was thus left alone with a small force to make head against the Persian host. Withdrawing his advanced posts, he proceeded in haste to Medina to ask for reinforcements, but found the aged caliph dying. Abu Bakr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, died after a reign of only two years and a half, on the 22nd of Jamadiusani, 13 Hijri. He is described as a man of a very fair complexion, thin countenance, of slender build, and with a stoop. Before he became a disciple of the Prophet وسلم, he wielded great authority over the Quraysh as one of their chief magistrates, and his wealth as a merchant and his sagacity as a chief gave him great consequence among the Meccans. Like his master, Abu Bakr was extremely simple in his habits gentle but firm. He devoted all his energies to the administration of the newborn state and to the good of the people. He would sally forth by night to help the distressed and relieve the destitute. For a time, after his election, he continued to maintain himself with his own private income. But funding that in looking after his property and business, he was not able to pay sufficient attention to the affairs of the state. He consented to receive 6,000 dirhams annually from the treasury. On his deathbed, however, he was so troubled at having taken public money that he directed one of his properties to be sold in order to refund to the state the sum he had received. Such were the simple, honest ways of the immediate disciples of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. End of chapter 4, part 1